Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. In this presentation, given as part of the Anarchism Research Group seminar series, Paul Reichstadt talks about legitimacy without sovereignty and political naturalism as an approach to anarchist political theory. Don't forget to click subscribe, like and share this video. I guess I want to say very briefly just two things to set this paper up. So the first thing is it's going to be hard to follow. So I, I like I really recommend looking at the handout because um, the audiences we have tend to respond very differently to it, depending on where they're coming from, sort of politically and philosophically. Um, and some have a lot sort of harder time sort of trying to see what we're doing than others. I think um, people associated with, with this or seminar in particular will have an easier time than most, but it's probably still going to be a bit weird. So just bear that in mind. Secondly, secondly, we the way as so this is part of a larger book that we're writing and catching this out and using this sort of material that I'll be presenting for the book is going to be straightforward. But one thing we're lacking is a good setup um, for uh, for it as an academic article. So we have a bunch of like argument. Uh, we have some argument and we have certain piece of evidence that we like to use that we're going to that I'm going to be presenting. But we're not quite sure how to set it up for an article. We have a few different ideas, but none of them really work very well. So if anyone like thinks of a great way, like this is something you can sell this article to or this argument to, then like please, please, for the love of God, let me know. Okay. Um, so without sort of any more sort of bumbling, I'll, I'll get to it. The overall goal of this project is to develop what we call a vindicatory genealogy of coercive non-state political structures. So in a nutshell, of a certain conception of legitimacy without sovereignty. And along with that, a debunking genealogy of the statism that's implicit in most contemporary theories of legitimacy. This will allow us to make sense of the legitimacy claims of a variety of sort of municipalist and anti-authoritarian political projects without falsely attributing to them the specific features of the currently dominant sort of nation state type system. Our longer term plan is to begin to apply these ideas to modern settings in a bit more detail, um, but I won't go into that here because, you know, time, space, etc. Also, we haven't finished doing the work yet, so there's that. I want to start with the problem of political legitimacy. So basically, under what circumstances, if any, should we put up with being subject to systematic coercive power? And we distinguish between two different approaches to legitimacy. The first is foundational. So basically, can coercion be justified at all? And if so, how? The second is comparative. Can we distinguish between good and bad forms of coercion? And then, if so, which ones come out better? In contemporary Western political philosophy, the first kind is prevalent while the second kind used to be. Our contention will be that some kinds of political institutions, like modern states, require both foundational and comparative legitimation stories to be legitimate. By contrast, a variety of non-hierarchical political formations require only comparative legitimacy to be legitimate. So put another way, a comparative account is necessary and sufficient to establish the legitimacy of societies with only horizontal coercion, Whereas societies with vertical coercion as well, like sovereign states, require a, a, both a foundational and a comparative account of their legitimacy. So to be clear, this doesn't actually tell us anything about which forms of either vertically or horizontally coercive structures should be deemed legitimate in the end. Nor does it claim that only horizontal coercive structures are legitimate. We kind of think so, but for the purpose of this essay, like this argument doesn't show that. All this argument says is that horizontal structures of coercion must answer the question of comparative legitimacy, while vertical structures of coercion must answer both the comparative question and the foundational one. Indeed, part of what we want to establish is precisely that there can be different kinds of legitimacy for different kinds of regimes. The statism implicit in so much modern political philosophy sometimes obscures this point. There is a sort of gold standard of what is in need of legitimation, namely the state, and any other kinds of regimes, both at sub- and supranational levels, are assessed insofar as they deviate from that. The contemporary statist focus on foundational approaches to legitimacy is not sort of wholly inappropriate, insofar as states do require this sort of legitimacy. However, we want to argue that foundational approaches are only needed to legitimize structures with vertical coercion, like sovereign states. For structures that have only horizontal coercion, the comparative approach alone is sufficient. So 
political naturalism, and so a sort of comparative approach to legitimacy, was arguably prevalent in a lot of sort of ancient Western political thought. We're not going to back this up, we're just going to say it and leave it. And gradually it became marginalized during sort of late antiquity slash the early Middle Ages, it's a bit hazy. The main source associated with the foundational approach is Aristotle's political naturalism. So according to Aristotle's political naturalism, human beings are political animals, because the city-state is the minimal self-sufficient unit. What matters most for our purposes here is that the city, on his view, is naturally required, so the kind of coercion that it embodies is in no need of justification. Now Aristotle, of course, was wrong here in at least two ways. First, he reifies the politics of his own culture and society to that of humanity in general. And secondly, his conception of naturalness is based on a theory of needs that we think can't actually do the work that it needs to to establish his idea of naturalness. Without going into detail, we think that any theory of needs that works is going to be too contextual in nature to yield the kind of empirically well-supported claims about naturalness that Aristotle's theory needs to get off the ground. Um, Enzo's does some work on this. Um, not going to really go into it, but basically it falls foul of the human lesson that you can't derive normativity from empirics, and the fact that any realistic theory of needs has to be more contextual than Aristotle really needs. So if a theory of needs can get us some conceptual naturalness, what can? So we propose long-term stability as documented empirically in especially archaeology and anthropology. Now, sidestepping sort of thorny conceptual questions of how to determine and define human needs, it's clear that if a kind of coercion has endured in all known environmental contexts where human beings have found ourselves and has been, dom and has been the dominant kind of coercion in human political organizations for well over 90% or well over 95% of human history, then that kind of coercion can rightly be labeled as stable. As we will see shortly, we can see that there is such a kind of coercion without naturalizing ancient Greek or any other particular political culture. So the available anthropo anthropological and archaeological evidence suggests, we think, that the minimal stable unit of human society is in a careful stateless society. We lived in such societies for well over 90% of our history, a few people still do, and many more did until relatively recently. Until, uh, so contrary to some sort of common misconceptions, stateless societies, of course, vary greatly in both internal organization and in their mode of subsistence, including not only hunter-gatherers, but also foragers, herders, and farmers, and they come on all sorts of different scales as well. Um, focusing, well, we have some quotes to back this up, but I'm, I'm going to keep it fairly minimal. Um, but so focusing just on like egalitarian band societies, Christopher Bohm writes that what we would call, so and what I would call, horizontally coercive social formations, lacking vertical forms of coercion between rulers and ruled, have been found on every continent and in a bewildering array of ecological niches. While it was a constant that leaders were weak and merely assisted a consensus-seeking process when the group needed to make decisions. They therefore have no leaders with any real authority, these leaders can't issue commands or orders, and thus cannot exercise any virtual coercion over other sort of equal political members. They do feature coercive political structures, including a variety of different sanctions, from ridicule to ostracism to death, without any central authority wielding the effective power to monopolize coercion. Now, finally, these kinds of political regimes seem to be maintained partly due to these groups' ability to form a moral community that is capable of imposing an egalitarian blueprint on their social and political life and exercising deliberate social control directed at preventing the expression of hierarchical tendencies, thereby ensuring that there is very little delegated, legitimate, effective authority, at least authority in the hands of individual persons. All societies... All societies feature horizontal coercion, but some societies have added structures of vertical coercion on top of them. The upshot of all this for our argument is that there seems to be a bedrock kind of coercion, horizontal coercion, which seems ubiquitous across all known forms of human society in ways that vertical coercion does not. Now that's an empirical claim that we want to argue has important normative implications. What we call the bedrock of legitimacy is simply the kind of coercion that is inevitable in any stable human community. We interpret stability, like I said, rather undemandingly here, as being able to reproduce itself over generations without falling apart, 
as many intentional communities are not, or requiring outside intervention, like, say, a hippie commune funded by their parents. As we have seen, the available anthropology shows us, also shows this to be what is sometimes called a self-sufficient anarchist community, which features only horizontal coercion among political equals. Now, we're now going to argue that this kind of coercion, horizontal coercion, is natural for human beings. The first part of our argument is inductive, and it's as follows. So the argument is, because horizontal coercion is present in all known forms of human society, there is good reason to think that it is universal among them. So all the human societies we know about feature, at minimum, horizontal coercion. Again, and this is true over all known natural, social, and historical contexts in which human beings live. This contrasts with vertical forms of coercion, so monarchs over subjects, masters over slaves, bosses over workers, which, though common today, are far from universal across human societies, or at least across human political communities. Because, at minimum, horizontal coercion is found in all human societies that we know of, we think that it's plausible to conclude that it's also universal among them. Now, for this, as for any inductive argument, the truth of the premises is logically compatible with the falsity of its conclusion. This isn't a bug, it's a feature, and it's a good feature of any empirical claim. So that's the inductive part. The next part of the argument is abductive, so it's an inference to the best explanation. So the universality of horizontal coercion in human societies, we think, is best explained by it being, in some sense, natural for human beings, because it seems to be universal among human societies. We hypothesize that horizontal coercion is, in some sense, natural in that it is an expression of our social human nature. So the naturalness of horizontal coercion, in turn, explains its ubiquity. It might be objected that our account could be strengthened by adding an explicit theory of human nature, but we think this would model the argument as well as weaken it. It would model the argument because our argument is only that horizontal coercion is natural, not that it is natural for certain very specific reasons. Though it is interesting to ask which features of human beings make it the case that horizontal coercion is natural for us, it's not a question that needs to be answered to determine whether this is the case. Insisting that we need to add an explicit theory of human nature confuses or would confuse what's needed to answer the second question with what's needed to answer the first. Doing so would also weaken our argument, since at this point we're not in a, and we, I mean, sort of all human beings now and around here, as far as we know, we're not in a sufficiently strong epistemic position to determine what the features of our human nature are with the degree of precision and empirical support needed to provide a stronger argument for our naturalness claim than the one we've already provided. Adding more theoretical components with weaker epistemic bases would thus weaken the whole, so the argument as a whole, overall. Note also that none of this means that vertical coercion is quote-unquote unnatural in some normatively problematic sense. It's certainly an inevitable product of human artifice, but that's not in itself necessarily a flaw. In fact, the same is true of many things we have good reason to think highly of, like vaccines. All it means, if we are right, is that horizontal coercion is somehow grounded in our evolved human nature, whatever that's like. And this is where the normative implications come in. Come in. Being natural for human beings, horizontal coercion doesn't require foundational legitimation. Now here, our argument introduces the normative component that ought implies can. If ought implies can, we cannot impose normative requirements that are impossible for agents to meet. So recall that if our foregoing argument is correct, horizontal coercion is natural for humans and therefore impossible for us to eliminate. If this is so, then we cannot impose upon human beings any demand that horizontal coercion be, be eliminated. Horizontal coercion thus requires no foundational theory of legitimacy to support it. However, we can still distinguish between better and worse structures of horizontal coercion, notwithstanding the Eurocentric assumptions of a lot of Western political philosophy, there's more than one way of organizing horizontal human communities. But these evaluations are comparative, not foundational. By comparing competing feasible or, or achievable horizontal structures, they determine which of them is more legitimate than the others. This, I think, suggests a debunking genealogy of the statism implicit in most recent political work or most recent philosophical work on legitimacy. Being a relative newcomer to human life on this planet, compared to the different forms of horizontal coercion that preceded it, taking states as the gold standard of what is in need of legitimation and assessing all other kinds of regimes 
at, for example, sub and supranational levels in terms of their deviation from the state is inappropriate. To be sure, the focus on states as objects of legitimacy and on foundational theories of legitimacy they require is not entirely misplaced, given the centrality of sovereign states to the last like four centuries-ish of politics. But given the power and importance of many different coercive structures at both sub- and supranational levels for most of human history, and the increasing importance of such structures in modern politics, this statism is now doing more harm than good and should be revised. So we have seen that there is no society without at least horizontal coercion. So we can use the comparative approach for at least that sort of political structure. Anything that also features vertical coercion, like a state, let alone sort of a modern, far-reaching one, needs to be warranted by a foundational theory of legitimacy as well before we can even ask the question of comparative legitimacy. This is because they add a different kind of coercion that is not ubiquitous across human societies. Vertical forms of coercion represent an inevitable addition to the horizontal bedrock of coercion and therefore stand in need of an additional foundational legitimation story. Given the available foundational theories, we would contend that the legitimacy prospects of state-like structures are in fact grim, but we're not going to argue that here. Instead, we're going to have to look at that elsewhere. Note, however, that the hinge of our argument is not its normative component like what implies can, which we take to be fairly uncontroversial. Rather, our argument turns on the empirical claim about the naturalness of horizontal coercion for human beings. So to put this point in slogan form, the bedrock of legitimacy is natural horizontal coercion without sovereignty. So if we're right, political naturalism is a viable option if updated with modern empirics. It does not yield, however, a defense of states, much less authoritarian ones, but rather shows that states must provide an additional foundational kind of legitimation story that justifies why someone subject to them should accept this additional and inevitable kind of coercion. Given the general failure of attempts at providing this, we think, like we said, the prospects are grim. By contrast, horizontally coercive structures require only comparative legitimacy, and this, we think, is a more tractable prospect. This is, in effect, a debunking genealogy of the state as the primary object of legitimacy. We have argued that the overwhelming focus on foundational approaches to legitimacy reflects an undue statism, which has led to underestimating and even ignoring com comparative legitimacy altogether. This statism has obscured the fact that all coercive structures raise questions of legitimacy, that some of these are not states and don't even have vertical forms of coercion at all, and that some coercive institutions require only comparative legitimacy, while others require both comparative and foundational legitimacy. If this is so, it is inappropriate to think, to think of legitimacy solely in state-centered terms. In a world that's increasingly shaped by non-state agents at various levels, it's also ill-suited to offering an understanding of legitimacy suitable for guiding much-needed projects of social and political reconstruction. By contrast, a more variegated view of legitimacy can approach non-state forms of political organization on their own terms, without supposing that they have to look like nation-states, which they often seek to supplant.